We're walking through Proverbs, just looking at the major topics. There will be about 16 of them, I think. And so we looked at the fear of the Lord. We looked at acquiring wisdom, separation and, and friendships, walking uprightly, the fruits of foolishness, trusting in the Lord, finances, keeping our heart, the tongue. And last week we looked at the family from Proverbs. And today we look at God's power and God's sovereignty from the book of Proverbs. So chapter 5, verse 21 will be our introductory verse, if you will, where, where it first occurs. Brother Jim, could you read that for us? For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his ways. So here it's, it's the first time it appears that uh, Proverbs, it, that uh, Solomon is introducing God's power, in this case God's omniscience, that God sees everything, God knows everything and that he is involved in the affairs of man, which, which we'll talk about, God's sovereignty. So Proverbs actually has a lot to say about this topic, and so we'll study that together today, the power of our Lord. But let's pray first. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the privilege, again, of, of assembling in your name, and pray now you use your word in our hearts and lives. Lord, to, just to teach us and to change us, to remind us about what a great God it is we serve. And Lord, I pray that you would be glorified in this time. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we see here, this is introducing the omniscience of God, which means that God knows everything. Praise the Lord. One of His, his many amazing attributes. And uh, Solomon actually has a lot to say about God's omniscience. So we'll look at some verses together. 15.3, Howard. We'll pick on you, Mark Zeus, 15.11. Um, Roy, 21.2. Any other readers on this section? Philip, uh, 24.12. So we'll stop there and just, this is the omniscience of God. Omniscience meaning omni, meaning all. Shunts means like knowing or, or conscience type of thing. So the omniscience means that God knows everything. All right? So, Brother Howard, 15.3. So notice, he sees everything. Amen? And then Mark 15, 11. How then the sufferings are before the Lord? How much more than the heart that is good in the Lord? So again, God is even aware and, and knows what's going on in hell. And then 21, 2. Every way of a man is well in his own mind, but the Lord pondereth. The Lord pondereth the hearts. Amen. And then 24, 12. So not only does it say that he pondereth the hearts here, but it says he keepeth the soul, which we'll talk about again in a moment, that God is sovereign as well. So God in, in this uh, section is omniscient, and we're looking at God's power and the greatness of our God. The omniscience of God, of course, is all throughout the Scriptures, not just in Proverbs. Um, Psalm 90, verse 8, Thou hast set our secret sins before thee. Um, and others. Hebrews 4.13, that not the eyes of the Lord see everything and so forth. So God is omniscient. Now God's sovereignty we'll look at, uh, and that is chapter 16, verse 4. It'll be our introductory verse. So Brad, if you would read that for us, 16.4. So again, God is in complete control and God made everything. Amen. If you would move up to verse 1, Brad, and read that as well. The preparations of the heart in the Lord, the vanity of his heart is from the Lord. And verse 2. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. Notice, the Lord weigheth the spirits. In verse 1, the preparations of the heart of man. And the answer of them, so God is in control. That's, the, that's what Solomon is getting across. God is sovereign. Look down at verse 9. A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. So God is not a passive God. Amen? He doesn't just sit back and say, we'll just let things happen. No, God is in control of his creation. He made everything, but he also knows everything and is in control of everything. And God directs things as he sees fit. 
This is important for us to understand. So let's look at some more on His sovereignty. Chapter 17, verse 3. Other volunteers in this section? Jackie, 17, 3, 19, 21. Anybody here? Okay, how about on this side? Any volunteers? Jack, James, thank you, 1921. And then we'll start back with Jim, 2012. 2024, Howard, 21, 1, Mark, 1 and 2. 21, 1 and 2. 21, 30, Roy, and there's a lot. 22, 2, Philip. We'll stop there for now. So this is all about the sovereignty of God from the wisest man outside of Jesus that ever lived. So go ahead, whoever was next. The Lord trieth the heart. So again, God is involved, isn't He? All right, and then 1921. There are many devices in a man's heart. God's counsel shall stand. And then 20, verse 12. The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made even both of them. Amen. And then 2024. So even his go, our goings are of the Lord. God is in control. Amen? And then 21.1, one of my favorites. Mark. And then two. So as we pray for our government, remember Proverbs 21.1. Amen? It says the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. And God turneth it with us over what he will. So remember that. God is sovereign. God is in control. All right. And then 2130. There is no way to the understanding or So you can see the sovereignty of God as the, as the creator, as the judge. And then 222, Philip. He's the maker of them all. And then we'll look at 24.12 again. We looked at it before under His omniscience. But now looking at it from the standpoint of His sovereignty, if thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, doth not he know it? And shall he not render every man according to his works? Again, God keeps the soul. God decides when it's time for us to go home. Amen? He is sovereign. And then last 21, 29, 26, let's turn there. And so what we're seeing here is that Proverbs is, or sorry, Solomon is revealing to us that God is omniscient and God is sovereign over His creation. He is the judge. He makes the decisions. Uh, notice 29, 26, many seek the ruler's favor, but every man's judgment cometh from the Lord. Now Job understood God's Sovereignty, right? Even in the midst of his horrible suffering, he said, He knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. In 2310. Uh, David understood it. If you go to Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24, David had, had a grasp of God's sovereignty. This is the passage that our um, hymn comes from that we often sing as an invitation. Psalm 139, 23, and 24. Who was my, Jackie, could you read those for us? Beautiful passage. So God is sovereign as our creator, as our judge. God is omniscient. And then next, any questions up to that point? Brother Mark. Yes, people often mistake trials for always as judgment, and we have to be careful there, don't we? And He gave us the book of Job to teach us that not all trials are judgment. Not all trials are chastisement. Some are, but many are meant for our good. Many are meant for our growth, for our refinement, as Job said. When He hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Christine? Yeah, it's the same thing. 
exactly. They were, they were under the belief that a lot of people have that everything's about karma. So who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? And Jesus said, neither one. But a lot of people do have that assumption that every time something quote-unquote bad happens, that's God pouring out His anger, pouring out His judgment, and that is not true. It's often God doing what God knows is best for everyone involved. And we may not even completely understand how it was best until we get to heaven, but we should never question whether it's best because God is sovereign, but He's also good. Any other questions, comments, Tanya? Karma, yeah, it comes from the Eastern religions. It's been around a long time. I believe it's still taught in places like India. Um, but it is not scriptural. Now, you do reap what you sow. <laughs> That's a different principle, and that is a scriptural principle. But this... What's that? Yes, but... But karma goes further. Karma is saying that it, it comes from your ancestors, and it's also saying, again, that basically anything, anything bad is, from, from a worldly perspective, me, means it's some sort of a punishment or judgment, and that is not true. So that's where karma falls apart. Right. It's very different from you reap what you sow. Because if you do... If you do sow a bunch of sin, you will reap. You know, if you smoke for 50 years and you get lung cancer, you reap what you sow, right? And you can say, well, Lord, how, take away my lung cancer. This isn't fair. No, you're reaping what you sow. That's just one example. But yes, ma'am. Um, I think karma also, like, is what it describes your heart. So if you know your heart might be karma, it's like you Right. Karma is all about fearing the, the wrath of the gods. Yep. Which is the exact opposite of Christianity, isn't it? Christianity is we love unconditionally, independent of what we get in return. Jackie? That's right. And from an eternal perspective, we all, if we have sown salvation, we will reap heaven. Amen? Independent of what happens on earth. And Jesus said, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven in Matthew chapter 6. What did he mean by that? Not all of our rewards for serving the Lord are here. Many of our rewards are there. Because we live for there. We're supposed to live for there. Well, this is good. Good discussion. Any other thoughts or questions before we move on to his omnipotence in Proverbs? All right, let's look at it quickly. 2311, I forget where I stopped. Brad, if you could read 2311 for us. And Jackie 30, verse 4, Solomon also introduces the omnipotence of God. Brad? So he is mighty. Amen? And then Proverbs 30, verse 4. Hmm. Is that Proverbs 30, verse 4? Okay. Because I do write down the wrong reference quite often. So rhetorical questions, God is saying, 
that only He can do these things and that He is in control of all and that He is all-powerful. Jeremiah called Him the mighty God, the Lord of hosts. So God is mighty, God is all-powerful, God is all-knowing, and God is sovereign as the Creator and the Judge over His creation. Thoughts or questions about that? Go to Proverbs 18.10 while you're thinking about a question you might have. One of my favorite verses in Proverbs, Proverbs 18.10, has its own teaching about God's power, and it's something we can learn a lot from, so I thought we'd do a little mini-study on it. Um, Brother Jim, could you read it for us? So God says there is safety for the righteous if we run into the tower of God's name. What do you think God means by that? Okay, He's our refuge. But when, when we think about the name of the Lord being a strong tower, does that mean that God's names are going to reveal His character? And the answer to that, of course, is yes. Uh, so... There are four primary names for God in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew. So what's one of them? Jehovah, the obvious one that, that the, the devil's disciples have abused for 150 years now. But a beautiful name of God. We aren't pronouncing it properly. We're, we're, we're giving the anglicized version of it because we can't speak Hebrew and we can't get those guttural sounds that we need to get. Uh, for Yahweh, um, but it is one of God's most powerful names in the Old Testament and is the name given to reveal His strength and to reveal His love, the name Jehovah. Um, he first introduced it in Exodus 6, if you want to turn there, Exodus chapter 6. And verse 3. Whose turn is it? James, could you read that for us? So here God is first introducing Himself as Jehovah. And this is one of the most common names of God in the Old Testament. Hundreds and hundreds of times it appears. For us as English speakers, whenever you see L-O-R-D in the Old Testament and it's all caps, that was the King James translator way of showing you when the Hebrew word for, for Lord was Jehovah. Because Jehovah is a Hebrew name. And the Old Testament for us is in English. So they did that for us. So if you see L-O-R-D but it's not all caps, then that's one of the different names of God. But if it is all caps, then you know that the Hebrew behind that was Jehovah. And Jehovah reveals the, the strength, the self-existence, the love of God to His creation as He is doing here in Exodus chapter 6 when He's speaking to Moses and introducing Himself as the all-powerful one that's about to redeem Israel from Egypt. In Isaiah 26, 4, if you want to turn there, is one of the other rare occurrences where they actually gave us the transliteration of the Hebrew word. So, Brother Jim, I'll, I already had you read, didn't I? So, Howard, could you read 26.4? Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. So, notice everlasting strength. So, the, the name Jehovah is to remind us that God is powerful which is what we're talking about in Proverbs this morning. Solomon said, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. There are times when we need to flee to that tower. Amen? For safety. It says, He that runneth into it is safe. There in Proverbs 18.10. So there are times when we need to remind ourselves that the God who saved us, the God who is our friend, the God that's going to take us to heaven is Jehovah, the all-powerful one. And there is safety in that name. And that is, what, that is the point that Solomon's getting across. Okay, so that's one of the common Hebrew names of God. There's three others. Anybody know a second one? Elohim. Elohim, Elohim um, is 
the first name of God in the Bible, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So when God first introduces Himself in His Word, He introduces Himself as Elohim. This is um, the plural name of God. If you go to Genesis 1.26, we'll see this. So what God is revealing in His first revealed name is that God is a trinity, that God is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Notice this Genesis 1.26, and God said, let us make man in our image. Now, who's the us? It's not angels. They didn't have a part in creation. It's not Satan. No, this is God. And God is revealing here His Trinity. And Elohim is a revelation of the fact that God is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Is there safety in that knowledge? There is, because what that means is Jesus Christ was God. Amen? There's safety in that. It means that the one who indwells us isn't just some force, as, as some of the cults try to say. No, it is God. God, the Holy Spirit, indwells us. There's safety in that for us as God's children. So the first revealed name of God, Elohim, reveals the plurality of God, if you will. Not that there are multiple gods. There's only one true God. But that God has chosen in His self-existence to reveal Himself as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And there is safety in that as well. Any thoughts or questions about that second Hebrew name of God from the Old Testament? Elohim. Okay, anybody know another, another one? Um, Emmanuel is a name of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. That's in Isaiah 7.14. And that is interpreted for us in the New Testament as God with us. And that is one of the names of Jesus. Praise God for that name because it reveals Jesus' deity. But it's God's Hebrew names. Anybody know... There's two other very common ones. Adonai. Adonai. Good. That's in Genesis 15, verse 2, where it's first revealed. Go ahead and read that for us, if you would, Philip. 15, 2. Lord God. So the name Adonai means master or Lord. And so what does this reveal about God's character? As Lord, His authority, right? That He is our master, that He is our Lord, that He owns us, that He's in charge. And that is the purpose of that name, is to reveal His lordship or His kingship, if you will, over our lives. So notice how each of the names is revealing a different part of God. Jehovah is revealing His strength and His love. Elohim is revealing His, His plurality as God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. And Adonai is revealing His authority as our Master, as our Lord. And notice it was translated here, Lord God. So Adonai is the authority name of God. And then there's a fourth one, I won't belabor it, and that is El Shaddai. And that's in Genesis 17 and verse 1. Now there are other Hebrew names of God in the Old Testament, but these are the four common ones, the ones that appear multiple times. Uh, Genesis 17, 1. Brad, would you read that for us? So this is the first time he revealed himself as El Shaddai, which is Almighty God. So whereas Adonai reveals him as the master and the Lord of our lives, El Shaddai reveals him as 
the Master and Lord of the universe as the Almighty God. In other words, He's almighty, all-powerful. And that reveals, again, that God is self-sufficient, but He's also able and, and willing to do anything for us as His children. And so that reveals His omnipotence primarily, the name El Shaddai. So those are the four common Hebrew names of God in the Old Testament. And now that you know that, Proverbs 18.10 makes more sense, doesn't it? The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. I like that word safe. There is safety in the names of God. Now there are many plural Jehovah names in the Old Testament, Brent? It is. I'm about to mention some of them. So by plural, what I mean is there are a few times in the Old Testament where God combined the name Jehovah with another name and made it a compound name of God to reveal more about God's character. And Brent mentioned which one? Jehovah Jireh? That's in Genesis 22. So we'll turn there. We'll quickly look at the compound Jehovah names which reveal even more about God's character and more of a safe place where we can flee to when we have troubles in our lives. Now, this is where Abraham was told by God to take his son up to the mountain and sacrifice him. So there's your context. God's asking Abraham to make the ultimate sacrifice and that is to give His own Son to the Lord. And notice here in verse 13 of Genesis 22, And Abram lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh, which means Jehovah will provide. Because earlier... His son asked the question, okay, we've got the wood, we've got the fire, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham said to Isaac, God will provide a sacrifice. That was a statement of faith. So this is also prophetic, is it not, about the Lord Jesus Christ, where our own Creator is going to offer up His only begotten Son on our behalf. But Jehovah Jireh means God will provide. Well, that's very comforting for us as God's children, isn't it, that knowing that He will provide... And he tells us so. He says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He says, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory and so forth. So that is the first compound Jehovah name in the Bible is Genesis 22, Jehovah Jireh. Any thoughts or questions about that one? The Lord will provide. Amen. All right, the next one's in Exodus 15, 26. We'll just do them in in Bible order. Uh, who would like to read that? We'll start back over here. Roy, could you read that for us? The Lord that healeth thee. So that is Jehovah Rafika. Please do not quote my pronunciations of these Hebrew words. Jehovah Rafika, the Lord that healeth thee. God is a God that heals. He's not just talking about our bodies, is He? He heals our soul when we get saved, amen? But God is a healing God, and that is very comforting for us as God's children. That's a place of safety to know that the Lord heals. Yes. No, we're getting to to that one. Jehovah Rapha is coming. Um, so this is Jehovah Rafika. And then the next one is Exodus 17. So just two chapters over. Verse 15. Um, Philip, could you read that for us? 1715. 
Jehovah Nissi. It means the Lord, our banner, or the Lord who protects us. He watches over us. So there's another one of the compound Jehovah names, which we find safety in. Amen? He's our banner. He protects us. All right, the next one's in Judges, chapter 6 and verse 24. Brad, if you would read that for us. It's in the Old Testament. Didn't even get a smile out of that one. Judges 6, 24. (laughs) Yeah, I said it's in the Old Testament. (laughs) Good work. <laughs> Most of us already know the word shalom means peace in Hebrew. So Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. And what a comfort there is in that name. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. God is a God that brings peace. And the, uh, yes, the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, is the Prince of Peace as well. So the Lord is our peace. Amen? Psalm 23, verse 1. You don't even need to turn there, do you? What does it say? The Lord is my shepherd, which is Jehovah Roy, O-R-I. The Lord my shepherd means He's our guide. He's our pastor. And... We get to the New Testament, and Jesus says in John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd. He's pointing back to Psalm 23, that compound name of Jehovah, Jehovah Roy, the Lord is my shepherd. Of course, shepherd feeds his sheep, protects his sheep, watches over them. Again, there's comfort in that, knowing that Jehovah is our shepherd. Thoughts or questions up to that point? All right, uh, oh, I thought I had these in scriptural order. Uh, Psalm 28, verse 1, then, is the next one. Had a couple out of order here. Um, Jackie, could you read that? The Lord, my rock. Jehovah Sir, S-U-R. Enough said, amen? The Lord, our rock. He is our foundation. He is the cornerstone. And He is the rock upon which our, our salvation is built upon. He is our rock. And as David said, O Lord, my rock. So again, there's comfort in that name, that the Lord is our rock. Thoughts or questions about that one? All right, Psalm 95, verse 6. Better hurry up, get these done here. Psalm 95, verse 6. James, could you read that for us? The Lord, our Maker. I'm not even going to try to pronounce this. I'm just going to, I'm just going to spell it H O S E E N U. Okay? Hosenu. Maybe. The Lord, our maker. In other words, He knows us. He made us, so He knows us. And there's comfort in that. The Lord, our maker. Uh, Where do we go from here? Isaiah 44 and verse 24. 44, 24. Uh, we'll start over. Jim, if you could read that for us. Uh, Isaiah 44, 24. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. The Lord thy Redeemer. Where would we be if we didn't have him as our Redeemer? which means He buys us back from the devil. He buys us back from sin. And the price that was paid was the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
the Lord thy Redeemer. Jeremiah 23, 6 is the next. Oh, the, the Hebrew, sorry, the Hebrew word there is G-A-A-L. Do your best. G-A-A-L. That's the Eng- English version of the Hebrew. Uh, okay, and then 23, 6. Um, Howard, could you read that for us? The Lord, our righteousness. I'm not even going to try to pronounce this one. T-S-I-D-K-E-N-U. Sidkenu, maybe. I don't know. Um, But God is our righteousness. Is there safety in that? Absolutely. That's what our whole salvation is about, isn't it? He hath made him to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So God is our righteousness. Jehovah is our righteousness. And that is another one of his compound Jehovah names. And then uh, Ezekiel 48, 35. Mark, if you could read that for us. Ezekiel 48 and verse 35. The very last word in the book of Ezekiel is the Lord is there. The Lord is there. Isn't that comforting? The Lord is there. And that it says that will be the name of the city. The Lord is there. And the Hebrew is Shama, S-H-A-M-M-A-H. You can look all these up. But Jehovah Shama, the Lord is there. Jesus said, lo, I'm with you, right? Always, even unto the end of the world. God said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So can you see the comfort and the safety by running to the tower of God's name? I just wanted to do that little mini study to help you out um, as we ponder the amazing power of our amazing God from the book of Proverbs. Thoughts or questions? Our time's up. Nobody? Howard, close us in prayer, please.